Get it. Hello, my name is Oxford Chamberlain, and I'm the director of liberal arts at Oxford University and Leicester University. And so now, the Master of Economics from Irvine Valley College is here today in the International McNeil Headquarters Studios of Amazingness to talk to you about Money Demandeth. Welcome, Professor. Out. 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 Haven't you retired? Haven't they put you out the pasture yet? You should have been gone long, long ago. Yeah, painful. From the International Film Studios in beautiful South Tustin. Ugh, Brits. Baja Tustin. We're here to talk about money demand. Now, most people think that the demand for money is infinite. If that's the case, uh, no, 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 you're confused. It is definitely not infinite. Money demand means the demand to hold money. And I can assure you that the demand for money is not infinite because if it were, people, when they got money, would hold it on to it. Exactly. Do they hold on to it? They do not. They get money rich and... They spend New it on car weird. poor. They get money rich and fancy restaurant poor. And what do you do when you are money rich? You spend it on weird props to use in videos. That's right. Something. Anyway. Uh, everybody has an asset portfolio. That is, they have things that they value. And the things that they value, there's always a reason why they have it. Like shoes. I have shoes. They cover my feet. I have this thing. It dispenses M&Ms to me. I'm an M&M holic. Uh, a couch you can sit on, an easel you can ride on, a camera you can talk into, etc. Every asset that people own, savings, they uh, put money away, investments, they hope their money will grow in the future. These are all reasons to have these things of value. Why do people keep money? You can't sleep on it. You can't drive it. You can't sit on it. Um, money has one purpose. The purpose of, of money is liquidity. Liquidity means that you can use money to exchange for other assets. It is the tool for the job. Just wondering, if you can't sleep on money, then what was Scrooge doing swimming in his vault? Uh, what was your name again? Uh, Oxford Billingham the Fourth. Yeah, Oxford Billingham, negative five points. We're going to get have you escorted out if you uh, make another silly outburst like this. Uh, maybe that's witty in uh, where you come from. Or so. Anyway, it's a, it's a pain. Uh, everyone's asset portfolio, liquidity. We need to make exchanges. Money is the tool for the job. That's the service that money performs. Uh, so that's why everybody keeps it in their asset portfolios. Why do people hold money? What are the motives for holding money? Well, you have to make transactions. So that's the first reason. Everybody, when they make transactions, has to have the money so that they can make the transactions. That's the transactions demand. Normally, people think that uh, transactions demand for money is some percentage of income. Uh, the precautionary, in case something happens. You know, I always carry a $50 uh, bill in, snuck away in my wallet in case something happens. I knew a guy who went to Tijuana with a $100 bill folded neatly in his sock. It was his precautionary demand for money. He wasn't going to spend it on anything. What the purpose of that was, if he uh, ran across a federale who didn't like him, he thought that uh, that, that would help him with his situation. And finally, speculative demand. Speculate, uh, speculators are people who buy now in the hopes of selling later at a profit. In order to, if, if you see a bargain, in order to uh, buy it, you have to have the money now to uh, buy it so that you can sell it later at a profit. So speculators keep money for speculative purposes. What determines the amount of money uh, that people demand? Well, what determines the demand for anything? Other things constant, the costs of uh, that item, whatever it is. So what's the cost of holding money? And the answer is 
the difference between what the money makes you when you hold it as money, which is essentially nothing. It earns you no interest, it brings you nothing. Not only that, but when you hold money, any inflation uh, reduces the purchasing power of the money you are holding, and as a result, that is also a cost of holding money. So the costs of holding money are nominal interest, and nominal interest has real interest, which is the opportunity cost of not having the use of or the benefit of your money, um, and the second is inflation. So these two together, real uh, interest plus inflation, uh, equals nominal interest, and that's why it's determined to be the cost of holding money. If the cost of holding money, that is nominal interest, goes up, the people will hold less. If the costs go down, they're willing to hold more. Um, so here's the money demand curve. At high rates of nominal interest, people cut way back on the amount of money they hold, as they did in the early 80s. Uh, the inflation rate was very high, and not only that, but if you took your money out of a bank account, uh, a checking account, or out of cash, and put it in one of these money market mutual funds, you could get close to 20% interest. So you had high inflation, uh, and also there was um, interest that you were passing up. Now that interest reflected the inflation. Now, by 2015, what if, how much money do you get if you put it into a, a savings account or something? 0 0.9. 0 0.9 if you're doing well. Maybe 0 0.5. Anyway, uh, what is the cost of holding money when, when the alternative to holding the money is a 0.9 interest rate or a 0.5 interest rate? And the answer is it's very a low cost to hold money. And as a result, people just leave their money in cash or in their checking accounts. They don't care. So what causes this, which is a change in the quantity of money demanded? And the answer is a change in the interest rate from I1 to I2. Boom, boom. That's what would cause that. But what would cause a change in money demand? That is a shift, money demand too. What would cause this? A change in one of the constants. One of the things that is assumed constant when we drop this relationship between nominal interest and the quantity of money that people want to hold. Like income. Uh, it's a transactions demand, so when income rises, people do more transactions, and as a result, they want to hold more money. That would cause a rightward shift. The price level. In the old days, when you could buy coffee for a nickel and a, a hotel room for $2 a night, if you were walking down the street with $10 in your pocket, holding $2, you were just fine. But if you walk down the street now with $10 in your pocket, are you doing well? No. Not close. So, because the prices have things have risen, the price level has risen, people uh, do a higher dollar volume of transactions and as a result they hold more money. That has caused the demand curve to shift to the right. Expectations of future price levels affect the quantity people want to hold. Now, we're not talking about the current price level, we're talking about the future price level. If you expect inflation in the future, if you expect inflation in the future, uh, generally speaking, you want to get out of money because money has a fixed nominal value. For every $100 bill that you have and for every $1,000 bond that you have, it doesn't matter what happens to the inflation, that's still going to be worth $10 or, I mean, $100 or $1,000 the bond. And with the inflation, the purchasing power of those dollars goes down. So uh, if you expect higher inflation in the future, you cut back on your money uh, holdings. Transfer costs. I can go anywhere, anytime, and there's an ATM machine on any second street corner, and I can get money if I need it. As a result, I don't worry about whether I hold much money. It, it's not a problem. And if I want to transfer money from my savings account to my checking account, I can do it with my phone app, for heaven's sakes. So how much money do I need to have on me at any given time to be holding? Not much. But what if I lived in the middle of nowhere and had to drive two hours to get to my bank and there was no uh, 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 internet service? Uh, I would have to hold the money I needed. I would hold lots more money because the costs of transferring the money from non-money accounts into money uh, would be fairly high. And finally, good old preferences. Um, you know, all these uh, grannies and grandpas who lived through the Great Depression, they don't trust banks. And as likely as not, you're liable to find uh, 
thousands of dollars stashed in a mattress or behind a painting or something. And what that means is they preferred to hold more money. They didn't want to invest it because they had lived through the Great Depression and they didn't trust those institutions. Now, since the Great Depression, of course, all of us, our preferences have changed. So we now prefer to have our money elsewhere. We're content to invest it in places and we're not going to hold it by stuffing it in our mattresses. Now, there's an important distinction between about money holding. There's a certain... The distinction is between the desired amount of money that people want to hold based on the costs of holding the money, income, price level, etc. That's how much they want to hold is determined by those things. But oftentimes, the actual amount of money they're holding is different from the amount that they desire to hold. Uh, the amount that is actually held in the economy is the money supply. Let me remind you that the money supply is the common medium of exchange. It is the amount of money held by the non-bank public. So money in banks as reserves is not part of the money supply. What that means is the money supply is being held by someone. So uh, the difference between desired and um, uh, actual money holdings is a big one. The other thing is velocity of circulation and money demand are inverses of each other. If people want to hold less money, they um, get rid of it, and the velocity of circulation increases rapidly. Uh, this is there's a there's an equation of exchange video that explains this well, and the next video gets further into this with the money markets. I think I'm finished.